All right, so it's hard to see where I've got it set up. And if you can see me, hopes, hopefully. Um, normally I've been doing uh, reading this book and reading it on um, a podcast on just audio. And today I'm up in this beautiful, sunny, wonderful area. My seat's a little slippery on this hill here, but um, I wanted to read to you chapter. I'm in chapter five, actually, of Visions of Glory. It's a story of a man, um, a man's astonishing account of the last days. And oops, my my camera is kind of slipping down, isn't it? And um, it's just a really amazing story. And whether you want to believe that it's real or whether you want to just uh, learn from it in a in a in an unreal way, you know, in a in a make believe, imaginative way. Either way is great because it's still just a fascinating story. It makes you kind of think twice about the, the choices that you make and how we're all interconnected and the unseen things in, in our in our world that you know that we can see and there's also unseen things that he he explains in the book which are really fascinating as well and and totally to me make a lot of sense. But anyway, so uh, he has um, well I'll just read and and if you want to follow up. Uh, the book again is called Visions of Glory as told to John Pontius so he wrote it and the person's name has been changed to Spencer for the book reading and um, I'm actually on page 76 so and I'm in chapter 5 so if you want to get the book grab the book you can you can also listen to my other audios from the beginning so you can get that as well and um, here we go it's called Caves, Keys and Callings Three Visitors about a week later, I woke in the morning with the impression that I was going to have three visitors that day. I liked having visitors because I was still recovering from the surgery and infection, and boredom was a problem at times. It also struck me in a comical way because Ebenezer Scrooge had, t had been told that he would have three visitors too. And you know how that worked out. <laughs> right? The first visitor was an older gentleman in our ward. He came and sat with me and read scriptures to me. He was kind to do this, but he stayed two hours, which left me quite tired. I slept for a long time after he left. The second visitor came at about 5.30 that evening. This was a brother from our ward who just dropped by on his way home from work. He said he felt impressed to come talk with me. He stayed an hour and said that he felt impressed by the Spirit to tell me a few things. The first was that I could be healed and that I needed to work on obtaining the faith to be healed. The second thing was that I had many things to do before I died. These two things struck me as interesting. I believed he was inspired to tell me those things because I knew that at some point I would be healed. I had seen it in a vision several times actually. I had been I had seen myself in a body free of disease and doing much more, but on a greater scope than he was implying. I felt like I did have the faith to obtain that blessing already uh, faith to obtain that blessing already and was moving as quickly as I could to obtain it. I didn't tell him that just a week ago an angel came into my bedroom and reminded me of these promises and healed my mind of my I'm going to die thinking. I accepted his inspiration in bringing that message to me. It was another witness of what I already knew to be true. By the time he left I was completely exhausted and I was not looking forward to a third visitor because the first two had exhausted me without leaving me with something I could truly use to upgrade my endurance or change my circumstances. I wasn't feeling critical or ungrateful for their kindness, just tired. That same night I couldn't sleep because of the unrelenting pain in my face and chest. I was no longer fearful of dying, but the surgeries in Mexico had left me in a tremendous amount of pain. Because of our financial condition, I could not afford prescription pain medication, and the only thing I was uh, that I had were Tylenol and Ibuprofen. They simply were not sufficient. The third visitor. My wife and I were watching the evening news in our bedroom at about 10.15 and I heard a loud knock at the front door which was only a few feet from our bedroom door. I asked Lynn, did you hear someone knock on the door? She answered that she had not. She asked if she, could, she should go check the door. I realized in that moment that this was my third visitor and that I would have to go with them. I was actually thinking it was another person from my ward and I'm not sure why I thought I would have to go anywhere. But I said, no, don't answer it please. I will have to go with them and I'm just too tired. She gave me a sympathetic look, not because I was tired, but because she assumed I was hearing things now. She turned off the lights, kissed me, and rolled over to go to sleep. I couldn't sleep because of the pain and the exhaustion were so... Oops, sorry, to turn the page. I couldn't sleep because my pain and exhaustion were so overwhelming. I know this sounds odd, but I really was too exhausted to sleep. I heard another series of knocks at the door. Whoever was at the door began knocking every few seconds over and over. 
I lay there thinking, if I get up, I will have to go with him. I finally began to realize that it might be an angel coming to take me from mortality. This was the ongoing war between my understanding of my physical condition and what the beautiful angel had so powerfully taught me that I was not going to die. Up until now, my faith had been stronger than my thinking, but on this particular night, I found myself once again wavering. I chided myself and anchored my faith once again. I must have fallen asleep because I awakened at 12.50 a.m. to someone knocking again on the front door. It was not an impatient knock, but just sounded like someone knocking. This time I realized that the knocking was on our bedroom door, not the front door. I knew it was not one of the kids because the knock was stronger and higher up on the door. The thought came to me again that maybe this was part of dying and I would have to go with them. I realized that I was soaking wet from perspiration from the few hours I had slept. I felt desperately ill, the kind of ill where you are too weak to raise your arms or to cry out for help. I had incredible pain in my chest again, despite what the beautiful angel had told me. I knew I could not live much longer without a miracle, which I did expect, but had yet to receive. And still the knocking on my bedroom door continued to resound with it, intermittent and insistent knocking. I immediately left, left my body. I think my body was just too ill to keep my spirit within it anymore. I moved upward and out of my body to a sitting position on my bed. I looked back to my right and could see my face and shoulders propped up on the pillow. My face was pale with a look of pain, and my body was not breathing. I felt so grateful to be out of it. The pain had stopped, and I felt full of energy and vitality. You have to remember, I had died twice before, and this time the relief I immediately felt by being out of my body was almost like drug, like a drug. It infused me with euphoria and liberation. I was so grateful to be out of that sick, pain-wracked body. I was rejoicing, and I felt far more than thrilled. I was jubilant, even though I fully expected to return to my body and live on to complete my mission. I could not doubt the angel's words, but for this moment I was overwhelmed with gratitude to be pain-free even for a while. I stood effortlessly and walked to the door to answer the knock. I looked back at my body, which was still lying in bed beside my wife. I felt connected to my body as if a divine rubber band was connected us, had connected us. Um, I knew that this was the spiritual assurance that I would be back. This was not death, but another chance to learn and see the things of God. Got an alarm going on, or a siren going on down there somewhere. My angel guide. I tried to open the door and could not. My hand passed through the doorknob, so I walked through it. I found myself facing a pleasing, a pleasant-looking male angel. He was an angel of light and had the full brightness of the other angels I had seen who had come to minister to the newly dead. But the instant I looked at, upon him, I knew that he had not come to t take me from the earth. He was not the grim reaper, so to speak. He had been my guide on several other out-of-body experiences, so I recognized him, even though I didn't know his name. It was a spiritual recognition. I trusted him and was ready and willing to go with him. The angel spoke to me verbally, not to, not to my spirit, as in other instances. He had a body and was not a spirit. I realized that I now, I now in my spirit self, was less substantial than he was. He held out his arm and said, Are you ready to go? I replied most gratefully, Yes. Unlike the other angels who had just floated through the walls and, wa and doors, he opened my front door by turning the knob and walked outside. It was daytime outside. It didn't even seem odd that in my bedroom it was a little before 1 a.m. and outside it was midday. What I concluded from this was that I was now in a vision even though this felt real and tactile. The angel closed the door to my home. We walked down the front steps and started walking down the sidewalk. He was on my right with his arm through mine. I could feel him and the warmth of his arm. I felt so good to walk. It felt so good to walk again. I hadn't been on my feet for weeks and had been ill even longer. It felt marvelous to do all of this without pain or fatigue. I felt as if I could walk without effort for days. I felt exuberant to be with him, like a little child who wanted to express his happiness by running, jumping, and laughing. I didn't, of course. I wanted to remain with him. I understood that he had something to teach me. We kept walking a long distance. We walked past businesses and houses. Cars passed us on the street and people walked past us on the sidewalk. I am sure they couldn't see us because we stepped off of the walk to let them pass. It was a visionary experience, but it was really, but it was very realistic. There was a light breeze and I saw that the breeze was blowing the angel's hair and, and affecting his clothes. I looked down at myself and realized that I was in my pajamas. I didn't feel awkward at all, but I noted that I could not feel the breeze, and it was not affecting me or my clothing. I thought, how strange. Here I am in the presence of an angel, 
and he's the one with the body and I'm the spirit and we're walking on foot up into the mountains. It was marvelous to me. I wanted to question him, but I felt like I should wait. I felt no labor or fatigue. I was walking effortlessly, which for a deathly ill person is like unexpectedly winning the lottery. Then the angel said to me, The first thing we will see will explain to you why you are experiencing your life as it presently is. I replied, Great. I would love to know the answer to that question. He was friendly and interesting to me. My mind was spinning with questions, and I'm sure he was hearing all this. His smile frequently, or he smiled frequently as he as we walked in silence. I felt like he knew me better than I knew myself. He was completely engaged in this event of showing me what I needed to know, even though we were not chatting as we went. I knew that there was purpose in everything he did. Caves and Bars We proceeded up a canyon I had been to many times. We walked along a way to where the paved road gave way to gravel. I could feel the road beneath my feet, but we were moving faster than walking speed, as if walking on a moving sidewalk at the airport. We arrived at the canyon quickly. The scene was familiar to me. I had been there many times on, a, on picnics and outings. As we stepped onto the gravel, the scene changed to a different set of blue-gray mountains with tall cliffs facing me with three towering mountain peaks jutting into the sky about the cliffs. The sky changed to a more sunset hue even though it was midday. There was a stretch of water between where we stood and the mountain as if we were on some island out in an inlet looking at the mainland. I could smell the ocean air and heard the waves breaking on the cliff face. I did not know where the vision was taking me. I was given to understand that I was now looking into the future at what the purpose of my life would be. I concluded that I was seeing a type or a metaphor of the purpose of my life, not actual events that would happen just the way I was seeing them. But I also understood that the mission being suggested by this metaphor would actually happen, if not exactly as I was seeing it now. I began to see our surroundings through spiritual eyes as the angel was seeing it. He asked me, Do you see the mountain? Yes. What do you see? I walked closer. There were lights high up on the mountainside. Finally, I realized they were coming um, from the mouths of four big man-made caverns. The caverns were made about 12 feet tall and about 150 feet wide at their opening. The openings had bars on them as if they were prisons. The caves extended deep into the mountains, with doors leading beyond what I could see. The four caverns occupied most of the mountainside. I replied, I see four large chambers cut into the mountain with bars on them. What does it mean? He replied, we need to come closer. The view changed instantly. I found myself standing right in front of the bars on a wide ledge between the bars and the cliff face. We were high up in the mountainside. There was a wide but steep road descending down to the valley below. I looked in this and saw thousands of people in the chambers. There were rooms within for, for large groups, cooking areas and massive gardens of flowers and vegetables. Deep into the cave, I could see closed doors along the back of the chambers. I assumed they were bedrooms, storage rooms, and other necessary accommodations. The people did not see, seem to see me, even though some of them were quite close, so that I could see them clearly. They were dressed well and going about their lives. They did not seem to consider themselves captives, but were healthy and happy. Children of all ages played and tended to chores. I watched them without understanding. Their whole circumstance seemed to uh, so improbable to me. Who are these people, and why are they in here? I asked. The angel pointed to the locks on the bars. The locks were on the inside. They had locked themselves into the caverns, and the bars were of their own construction. What does this mean? I asked the angel. Why have they locked themselves in the mountain? He smiled and replied, That is right. These individuals have locked themselves away because of the persecution, abuses, and mistreatment they have endured from religious organizations and from the abuse of governments and the authority of the world. I perceived that this was both a good and a bad thing. They had isolated themselves from the world, but they had also isolated themselves from further light and truth. I asked, why are you showing me this? What does it have to do with me? Then he showed me in vivid detail the pains and sufferings and abuses these people had endured while living on this earth. They had been persecuted and killed for generations before they found a way to separate themselves from the world. He said, only individuals like you, who have been willing to undergo similar pain and abuses as these people have, will they ever listen, oh, let's see, he said, only individuals like you, who have been willing to undergo similar pain and abuses as, they, as these people have, will they ever listen to and trust? You must continue to drink of this bitter cup and not become bitter yourself. This will give you the experience and knowledge you need so that when you are called to work with these people, they will trust you and recognize in you 
that you are a fellow sufferer and refugee from persecution. These sufferings and your personal triumph over them will be written on your very soul and into the sinews of your body, and they'll recognize it, and they'll trust you. Then he said something that I have pondered for years. He added, They will see that you also belong to the fellowship of the suffering of Christ. The key... This makes one here. While I was trying to understand all this, a young woman came toward us carrying a key in both hands. She did not look like the people within the caverns, but she was an angel of light. Like my escort, she wore a long white glowing robe. She was beautiful and quite young. He took the key from her and handed it to me with both hands, with great reverence and care, as if it were precious and fragile. The young woman angel remained, watching me hold the key with great interest. I studied it for a moment, marveling at the beauty of the craftsmanship. I turned it in my hand several times, admiring it. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. The key was about a foot long, shaped like a modern key, with a rounded handle and a shank with saw-like ridges on it and grooves on the side. It was heavy as if made from solid metal which looked and hefted like solid gold. The feel of the metal was soft like velvet, not hard like gold. The handle was about six inches across with precious gems infused into the metal. It appeared as if the jewels had been cast into the metal because I could not feel them on the smooth surface of the key. But each stone was clearly visible and sparkling within the metal as if the metal were transparent over the stones. Each gem seemed to have a tiny light source within it which made the key sparkle like glitter with light that came from within the key rather than as a reflection of the sun. The pointed end was emerald green, the shank was blood red, and the handle was a vivid blue. It looked old, perhaps millions of years old, though it was not scratched, worn, or damaged. It was an intricate, so intricate and beautiful that I thought of the Liahona, which had been crafted by God himself. I am certain that no human could have made this key. I noticed that there were symbols on the key which I could not read. And you know what? I'm going to stop right there. I know that's a kind of a cliff uh, to hang on there, uh, but I want to get on my hike. And um, Rufio's ready to keep going too. Uh, had some places to go still. So I hope you've enjoyed that. It'll give you something to ponder and think about. And you know, if you've got your book, you can continue reading. And um, we'll talk to you again soon. Just have a super great day. See ya. Bye-bye.